Uh, it is a distinct pleasure for me to have the honor to introduce our speaker tonight. I met Alejandro uh, for the first time today only, but I have known of him and his work for many years, including such landmark projects as the International Passenger Terminal in Yokohama, Japan, the Blue Moon Hotel in Groningen, the Netherlands, and the Carabanco, did I pronounce that properly? Carabanco, yeah, I said, okay. Carabanchel social housing block in Madrid. Uh, this last project I had the opportunity to visit not too long ago. I was particularly drawn to these projects because each in their own way challenges the traditional notion of what a facade is. And as such, I have also used each of these in lectures that I've given on the subject of the facade. And then a few years ago, I came across Alejandro's brilliant essay entitled The Politics of the Envelope. I was extremely pleased to find a contemporary architect author who was so eloquently, who wrote so eloquently on the aspect uh, of the facade that is rarely addressed. Thus, when conceptualizing this lecture series, Alejandro was at the top of my list of those people that I would like to invite, and I am terrifically pleased that he accepted our invitation. Alejandro Zarapola was born in Madrid and trained at the Escuela Tecnica Superior de Arquitectura de Madrid, where he graduated with honors. He went on to receive a master's degree from Harvard's Graduate School of Design, where he graduated with distinction. Between 1991 and 1993, he worked at the Office of Metropolitan Architecture in Rotterdam, following which he established his firm Foreign Office Architects in 1993 and most recently AZPML in 2011. His work has consistently merged the practice of architecture with theoretical investigations, integrating architecture, urban design, and landscape architecture in his projects. His practice has also produced critically acclaimed and award-winning projects for both the public and private sector on an international scale. Since 1993, Alejandro Zerapolo has also been extensively involved in education at the international level. He led a diploma unit at the Architectural Association in London between 1993 and 1999. Between 2000 and 2005, he held the Berlaga Chair at the Technical University in Delft, the Netherlands, and was in the inaugural recipient of the Norman Foster Professorship at Yale University between 2010 and 2011. Between 2012 and 2014, he served as Dean of the School of Architecture at Princeton University and has been a visiting critic at Columbia University and UCLA. He is currently a tenured professor at Princeton. In addition to his professional and academic roles, Alejandro Zerapolo is recognized as an original theorist and thinker of contemporary architecture. With a unique capacity to identify social and political trends and translate them into architectural discourse. His text can be found in many professional publications, including El Croqui, Quaderners, ANU, Architecture Plus, Log, AD, and the Harvard Design Magazine. Please join me in welcoming Professor Alejandro Zerapolo. OK, thank you very much, uh, Randall, for the invitation to come back to Syracuse. I think last time I was here was probably 2010, no, maybe earlier than that. Um, so it's a pleasure to, to be uh, back uh, here uh, with a slightly different uh, proposal to the one that I did last time, uh, mainly at the request from uh, Randall, who um, given the choice between showing my, my practice uh, with some kind of uh, theory uh, uh, about the facade and uh, showing uh, a research that uh, was supposed to have become a book uh, already, uh, he chose uh, for me to deliver the, the lecture about, about the theory of the, of the envelope, uh, which is something that, as I, as I was uh, saying, was, was, can, can we have the lights off? Because I think everybody will uh, see better if, if the lights are 
are off. Uh, so the book uh, is, is a project that I've been working uh, now for over 10 years uh, in different uh, stages and, and was supposed to be already published. I was hoping that I could uh, use this as a kind of occasion to, uh, to present the, the book, but it's been delayed for, I was telling Randall, for uh, a number of reasons uh, for nearly uh, a year. Uh, nevertheless, he, he wanted me to present uh, the research, and, and that's what I hope I will, uh, I will, will be able to do. It's, it's a little bit disorganized. I will have to go very quickly because I have a, 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 lot, of, uh, a lot of material. Uh, it doesn't matter whether I finish it completely or not. Uh, I think what I would like to do is to put forward the proposal and, and hopefully engage in a, in a discussion because uh, one of the, the things that I uh, am always interested uh, when I practice as a, as a theorist is, uh, is um, uh, to engage with theory as a polemic. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't believe in, in critic. Uh, I, don't, I don't like the, the, the theorist as somebody who looks at things and decides whether they are right or wrong and, and criticizes them. I prefer uh, to practice theory in a way in which I put forward a proposal and I know that that proposal will, will generate a certain discussion, a certain, a certain polemic. And this uh, polemic of the envelope, uh, I, I want to give you a little bit of, of uh, a frame of why I have been interested in this, uh, in this issue uh, for, for, <coughs> for a number of years. This is a slide that I used to, uh, with which I, I used to start my lectures maybe 25 years ago, uh, and it was all about uh, the, the world of the no borders. Of the, the, this was uh, uh, aiming to illustrate uh, something that I, that I was very interested in at the time, which was Harvey's uh, uh, idea about, <coughs> about uh, uh, mechanisms of temporal and spatial displacement as the, the, the mechanisms that, uh, that produce the world at that, uh, that was, were producing the world at that time, so uh, the transportation, communication technology on one side, the, the, the spatial, the capacity uh, that we suddenly uh, um, uh, enhanced enormously um, uh, in, or, in order to be able to move ourselves and to, and to, and to communicate and to move things around the other uh, in space, uh, and the other, the other uh, was uh, uh, the mechanisms of uh, credit, the mechanisms that enable us to advance, to play with time, uh, to move things in, in time. And I, I was really fascinated with the idea that, uh, that this uh, background could actually um, uh, serve as the basis of uh, a new type of, uh, of architecture. Uh, now, fast forward, this is 25 years ago, maybe, or, or more. Oh, so. Uh, and, and what we uh, see is that these very same mechanisms are uh, used actually to bomb cities. Uh, infrastructure is now used to, as, as a projectile to, to demolish buildings. And, and you all know what happened in 2007 with the, the, the credit uh, system, which, which we are still uh, uh, involved with. And this generated a whole set of uh, processes that uh, that actually, rather than than uh, uh, implementing what we thought was going to happen, uh, which is that the borders would disappear, that things would move around, uh, suddenly we realized that actually borders are becoming nastier and stronger than ever before, and that is the moment in which I start uh, thinking that maybe uh, rather than, than uh, playing with the idea of an architecture that, that melts in the field, that, that, uh, that dissolves, that has no borders, uh, that maybe what, what would be more uh, culturally relevant at that time was to think in the border, to think in the, in the limit of the, of the building as a, uh, as a problem. A, a number of other things that happen uh, which, which is that suddenly we, we became aware, uh, certainly aware, that, um, that we were uh, driving towards uh, a disaster uh, uh, in terms of uh, climate uh, change. 
uh, made me uh, reaffirm myself even more on the idea that those borders that, that, uh, that separate environments that uh, pre prevent, uh, for example, heat or, or flow uh, to move through space uh, were uh, more important than, than ever <coughs> before. And, and therefore, uh, the, uh, the, the, the theory started with the idea that if the plans and the sections uh, uh, which had been the, the main mechanisms for architects to uh, formalize uh, space were becoming increasingly uh, uh, unimportant in the face of the mechanism of designing the, the, the envelope of, of, uh, of uh, buildings, maybe of, uh, of cities. And so that is when I wrote that uh, first text that uh, <coughs> Randall uh, cited uh, the politics of the of the envelope in which uh, I uh, try to uh, come up with some sort of classification of types of uh, buildings uh, that depending on their proportions or on their geometries would uh, and gen generate uh, uh, different forms of engagement and attachments to to the uh, to the cities uh, fast forward again this is 2007 2014. I get an invitation to be part of uh, Fundamentals uh, with the specific task of doing the facade uh, uh, because it was something that I had already been, been doing. And, and at this point um, is when the, the, the work uh, that constitute the, the body, the main body of, uh, of this uh, project, of the ecologies of, of the envelope uh, uh, form, uh, uh, very much uh, informed by the idea that uh, that Remkul has had at the mom at the time that the, the Biennale had to become almost like a trade fair. So the the the, the capacity or the possibility to look at buildings uh, from uh, the perspective of uh, uh, building elements uh, was was very important in, in the way in which he he uh, set the, the, the brief. And, and so when I started working on this, I uh, started uh, reviewing material. Uh, and I realized I, I came up with uh, materials like, like this from, from facade uh, manufacturers uh, that, uh, that uh, were interesting and, and shocking because uh, I, I got these files in which there was one uh, mock-up of a facade and next to it, the building. And, and systematically, you know, you go through these things and, and, and you see that the mock-ups are so much more sophisticated than the buildings. So, uh, you know, buildings that are pretty mediocre uh, uh, suddenly have, uh, or when you, when you go, go close uh, uh, onto them, you realize that are really exciting. Uh, and, and so I, I thought that, that to exploit that uh, conflict uh, was, uh, was an interesting uh, proposal for the for the Biennale, and, and in, in some ways, uh, uh, to start a whole uh, polemic about about uh, this uh, uh, micro scale of uh, of uh, designing uh, buildings. I mean, th this is uh, I use this as a as a, as an example of uh, of uh, how we have trained to think in architecture. This is a Seagram building, as as you all know, uh, and and you see that the Seagram building is drawn with a series of lines uh, down the, the facade, uh, parallel lines, uh, which basically uh, form the composition and the texture of that, uh, of that envelope. But actually, what is uh, uh, really amazing is that every one of these lines contains a whole uh, uh, set of worlds that, that at that moment became uh, really <coughs> Uh, interesting to, to, uh, for me to, uh, to try to understand because I had seen these drawings. Uh, we all have seen these drawings uh, from manufacturers when we are designing, when we are discussing things, but I, I couldn't really understand them. I, I, couldn't, I, I couldn't understand what was going on in there. And yet, in those, uh, in those very complex, very... Uh, uh, um, elaborate uh, things, uh, objects that, that we use but we don't, we don't understand, we, we use to, to, to compose these, these uh, 
uh, facades and these envelopes, but, but we don't really know what, what they are doing. But in those uh, uh, micro uh, uh, constructions is where air, energy, water are being sorted out. And, and air, water, and uh, energy are probably some of the most relevant, some of the, the, the most uh, uh, politically loaded things that we can discuss today in the, in the age that, that is called the, the Anthropocene. So, so the, the idea of, uh, uh, of the, the research evolved uh, from, from that uh, larger uh, scope, uh, thinking about the, 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 the proportions and the, the geometries of the envelope and trying try to find uh, an argument about, about them and, and an argument that would connect them not as uh, independent objects that maybe refer to a historically constructed uh, uh, discipline, but on the contrary, <clears throat> it enables uh, us to relate the discipline to this, uh, uh, to this emerging uh, 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 political uh, grounds. And so the, the project uh, formed uh, with this idea of thinking how to look at these uh, objects, at these constructions, micro constructions, uh, micro sections, uh, uh, almost as if we were, we were doing a, a kind of paleontological analysis of this field, which is uh, the, the facade or, or the envelope that is increasingly important in the discipline and yet uh, rather uh, poorly uh, uh, theorized. So uh, uh, thinking about, about uh, uh, how to uh, classify, how to uh, understand these, uh, these, uh, these things, I, I came up with, with the idea of, uh, of uh, analyzing them almost as if there were ecologies, almost as if they were species uh, that are growing in respect to, to changing ecologies, very much like, like Cuvier or, or Saint-Hilaire or Darwin uh, uh, started looking at, at animals when they started the, the classifications of, uh, <coughs> of animals uh, uh, at the end uh, or during the, the, the 19th uh, century. And I, I came with, a, with, a, with a, I, I found this uh, citation from, uh, from Dennett, uh, who is a, an evolutionary uh, biologist, uh, who, who was saying, postmodernism, the school of thought that proclaimed there are no truths, only interpretations, has largely play, played itself out in absurdity. But it has left behind a generation of academics in the humanities, disabled by their distrust of the very idea of truth and their deep respect for evidence, settling conversations in which nobody is wrong and not, nothing can be confirmed, only asserted with whatever style you can master. So the, the idea of taking the discussion of the architectural envelope from uh, the, the field of, of uh, representation, from the field of uh, this kind of uh, <clears throat> uh, um, uh, rather dilettante uh, 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 approach to these uh, technologies was very much uh, part from the very beginning uh, of this attempt to, to actually find the, the truth. And this is a truth that is not, is not fixed, is not set. In fact, uh, one, of the <coughs> one of the main uh, tools that, uh, that uh, I use in order to form this was to use uh, history. History as, as the the, uh, the process in which these animals, these species, uh, come into, into being. These are some of the diagrams that, that we did for the, uh, for the Biennale, uh, in which we identified uh, at that moment 12 uh, species. Uh, uh, and we, uh, I mean, all, all, this, is a, this is a history, it's also a recent history, uh, because the envelope is a problem that. Uh, that actually becomes important at the end of the, of the 19th uh, century. So we identified these 12 uh, <coughs> uh, species of, uh, of envelopes, and we tried to see in what way they grow or they prevail or they die. Sometimes they, they, uh, they become extinct. Sometimes they, they revive uh, again, and, and they are crossing 
a number of events like the, the, the oil crisis of 1973 or the Second World War, uh, the end of the Second World War. So there are, there are, there are a number of uh, uh, events that are, that are happening that are crossing those species and transforming them. And, and, and we were very interested in, in actually showing uh, how these uh, uh, species um, uh, evolve through the changing of environments, very much inspired with the idea uh, of uh, evolutionary biology or, or uh, ecology as a, as a, uh, as a way of uh, understanding uh, um, uh, these objects. This is, this is kind of a, uh, this is outdated. Uh, now there are no, no longer uh, 12 uh, assemblages because some of the, uh, the, the things that we call assemblages, this, 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 um, this uh, species, we, we call them facade assemblages in order to, to, uh, to describe uh, a number of constructs that are no longer their material, that they're no longer the materials in the way we used to uh, look at materials in the field, which is bricks, steel, glass. They are combinations of, the, uh, of all these different materials. That's why we call them uh, assemblages, and we see how they, uh, they evolve uh, through the, the, basically through the 20th uh, century and, and react uh, to these uh, changing uh, environments. And so the structure of the, of the book uh, is, uh, uh, tries to uh, analyze uh, these species, these uh, ecologies of the, of the envelope, uh, trying to, end to, to de describe them from different uh, perspectives for uh, uh, basic uh, uh, perspectives. One is, uh, is uh, functional, so uh, uh, one is what are these envelopes doing? They are, they are regulating transparency, the, the ingress of light and vision. They are uh, waterproofing the, the building. They are uh, what, uh, air tightening the building. They are containing the, the, the air and, and, and regulating the, the breathing of, the, of these, uh, of these uh, buildings. They insulate or not. Uh, and finally, they have a kind of economic uh, performance. There, there is another uh, uh, scope uh, in the book, which is what, what we can call a, a kind of elemental uh, analysis of the, of the building, in which very much like uh, Cuvier or Saint-Hilaire would do, they, they look at uh, the feet of the bird, and they would know by looking at the feet of the bird what kind of animal these feet belong to. So uh, in, in a very similar way, we identified uh, three uh, elements, um, three components, the malleons, the joints, and the membranes that are very uh, specific to envelopes. Uh, and, and we try to uh, create also these micro histories of, of every one of these ele uh, elements or, or, or narratives in a way. I mean, we, we, uh, the, the project is very, is very, in some ways, uh, literary, and I, I like that. I, I don't pretend to be a kind of uh, serious uh, historian. I'm, I'm uh, putting forward proposals uh, rather than trying to, uh, to um, discover uh, the, the very essence of, uh, of things. I, uh, I propose narratives in which, uh, or, or micro narratives for every one of these elements that, that try to tell a story of how the elements have uh, evolved. A, a third uh, analysis is uh, what we can call organizational, so how uh, envelopes have been uh, organized, and they modern envelopes, uh, uh, and, uh, and we uh, came up with these two uh, uh, fundamental points, panelization and, and layering. Those are the systems of organization that, uh, that uh, again, like, like in uh, paleontology, form the plan of consistency of these creatures that, uh, that uh, we are, are looking at. And the final one, which is actually the one with which we started uh, with in the, in the Biennale, th those uh, uh, three um, cross readings of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the objects that we are trying to uh, to classify um, uh, um, are, are um, looking or are crossing with these uh, 
these uh, species and, and their evolution through the century. So they are typological, if you want, or, or uh, they are about the uh, speciation of, of, the, of the envelope, and there are nine uh, now. So in order to, to, uh, to explain a little bit uh, what, what, we are, what we have done, I mean, the book is, uh, is uh, virtually done. Uh, we are just uh, clearing images and doing things like, uh, like that. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go through some of them. I, I have too many, uh, too many slides, but I would like you to, uh, uh, to see how what, what we are trying to do is to locate every one of these species or elements or systems of assembly or performances in, in an ecology that relates them to things that are uh, beyond the field of, uh, of architecture that uh, link them to uh, political uh, facts, uh, political events, uh, technological uh, discoveries. Uh, you will see that, that, uh, that may, maybe in, in some of them there are transfers of technology from other industries into uh, architecture, but always trying to uh, make them uh, create this or, or, or connect to this ecology that is permanently changing through the century and making these, uh, these elements evolve. I, I think it's very important to, to say that uh, by, by analyzing them historically, what we are trying to uh, explain or, or to conceptualize that uh, looking at these building technologies as the latest uh, way in which we can uh, do uh, curtain wall is pointless. We have to always look at them in respect to uh, a given uh, ecology. You cannot say this is the next, uh, the next envelope uh, species that is going to, to prevail. Uh, uh, every one of these uh, constructs and the examples that, that we have uh, collected are moments of equilibrium and are moments uh, uh, that are often huge gambles, huge experimentations that, that maybe today would, would not, not be even possible because we are uh, living in a, in a culture that is increasingly reducing uh, the level of, uh, of risks that we can take when, when designing buildings. But, but you will see in some of the, the examples that people were really experimenting with these technologies and inventing them as they, as they were uh, making um, making these uh, these projects. So starting from the uh, from the uh, performative analysis, what these uh, uh, envelopes uh, uh, do? Uh, as I said, uh, we we were looking at transparency, we were looking at uh, uh, insulation, we were looking at air tightness, water tightness, and economy. Those are the the five uh, categories of. Um, of performance uh, and, and the idea of transparency is obviously uh, very loaded not not only from a from a functional perspective but also uh, from a uh, from a political perspective in, in architecture probably it appears in certain climates uh, and also uh, you will see that that we every one of these species is, is like like animal species is is situated is localized in respect to a, to a certain uh, ecology, so uh, uh, sophisticated cities that uh, had the problem of bringing light into the into the building, and sometimes looking into the street are in, in northern uh, or where in, uh, or started in in northern Europe, in the Netherlands, where obviously they wanted to get as much uh, light inside as uh, as as possible in England. Mm -hmm. How do we call? I mean, the, the, what is uh, 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 also interesting about this uh, technology is that it gravitates around the industries of of uh, uh, making glass. Glass as a, as a material is obviously attached to the performance of transparency uh, in buildings, and this uh, 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 evolution of of technologies from making uh, plate glass to the Foucault. Uh, uh, process to, to uh, flatten, uh, flatten uh, very large pieces of, uh, of glass uh, is also is, uh, has been a, an important uh, part of, of understanding this uh, evolution of transparency in the envelopes. So some of these analyses 
uh, try to see what are the, the, the sizes of, of uh, glasses that were achievable on, on different uh, times. And, and you can see that actually now we can make pieces of glass that are maybe 18 meters by, I think, 18 by, by, by 3 meters is, are like the largest pieces of glass we can do. That was not possible uh, when uh, Harwick Hall, which is the, 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 the building I, I showed in the previous slide, uh, was, uh, was uh, built. And, and yet the desire for, for transparency uh, existed uh, there. It was, a, it was a, and if we look at the history and how these technologies evolve, they evolve, for example, uh, uh, in respect to a nascent uh, commercial, urban commercial uh, uh, demand uh, for department stores, facades that can uh, show uh, products uh, to people, and also industrial work, dense industrial uh, work. Uh, the Gantt uh, building in, in St. Louis now demolished, but, but representative of a, of a certain uh, type of technologies that uh, uh, start uh, at the at the end of the of the 19th century and keep evolving uh, through the uh, through the century. Now there are, there are some interesting uh, readings that we can we can do uh, by looking, uh, for example, at this example, which is which is one of one of my my favorites. Uh, it so happens that at the end of the 19th century in Chicago, uh, uh, the, there is a number of buildings designed with an enormous amount of, uh, of uh, glazed surface. Some of them, I mean, the Reliance building, for example, has more transparent area, uh, whether you believe it or not, than the Lever House, for example. Uh, so it, it happens that, that this cest uh, 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 towards making buildings increasingly transparent is suddenly reversed in the early years uh, in Chicago, uh, also, of the, of the 20th century. Why does this happen? It happens, uh, Gideon uh, would say that is because uh, in 1893 there is the uh, World Columbian Ex Ex Exposition in, in Chicago and, and in that uh, exposition there is uh, uh, the pro a proposal, a stylistic proposal of a, a return to a classical language and therefore, uh, therefore the new buildings are kind of neoclassic and more uh, more closed, um, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, but if you look at Hollabird, who was one of the guys who was actually making those uh, buildings, he has an entirely uh, different uh, perspective, uh, which is that, that the, the change happened that, uh, because in, in the World Exhibition of, of Chicago, which is the first World exhi Exhibition that is fully uh, 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 lit uh, with uh, electricity, uh, it, it signals a moment in which the price of electricity starts going down uh, while the price of glass, the uh, price per square foot of polished plate glass, uh, uh, starts going up. So uh, this is more or less the moment in which the Reliance building is, uh, is, uh, is built. Uh, and this is what happens uh, after, which is that the the, uh, all, the, all the glass industry uh, is uh, uh, located around the, the, uh, the Pittsburgh uh, gas uh, uh, area, uh, and, and that's when uh, the, the price of glass uh, goes down. But as electricity uh, uh, goes down and the uh, reserves of, of gas uh, become exhaust, suddenly the price of glass uh, goes up. And that's the moment in which buildings become more opaque. So uh, for me, that uh, reading of uh, the ecology of these buildings is far more interesting than the, the one that Gideon makes, which is the traditional art historical uh, reading of architecture as some sort of system that, uh, that feeds uh, itself devoid from any other uh, um, uh, ecology uh, and, and so in, in that light I mean you will see that many of these uh, events that are happening the oil this is the, the price of uh, of uh, energy through the uh, through the 20th uh, century uh, and and the kind of ups and downs that that take place every one of these peaks and troughs have a, an immediate visible effect uh, 
on the way buildings are designed and the type of uh, explorations that, that architects engage in. That is the view that we are uh, interested in, in, in doing. So transparency uh, moves on, uh, buildings uh, in Manhattan become more transparent, uh, new technologies appear, the, the, the disruptive uh, effect of, for example, uh, the, the invention of uh, uh, float glass in the, in the 60s has a radical uh, uh, effect on what we can achieve uh, with transparency. And, and you can see, for example, in this series of, uh, of buildings, how different uh, glass technologies affect the, 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 the way in which buildings are, are designed are, and, and conceived. This is lever house, plate, single uh, glass. Uh, this is uh, Pepsi Cola, built almost immediately after uh, uh, the invention of float glass, using float glass. It's a, it's a much more transparent glass. It, is, it cannot be uh, tinged, for example, like plate glass, you, you could make it more green, more blue. Uh, uh, when when uh, <coughs> float glass uh, appears, it has to be clear uh, glass. So the, the, the image of, of the building uh, and, and the way the, the, the building is, is designed entirely changed. Then, then we go uh, to uh, solar filter, solar ban, crisis of oil, energy goes uh, expensive. Uh, we, uh, we have to, um, we have to uh, start treating buildings uh, in order to protect them from uh, solar exposure and, and double glaze them. And, and so buildings become this kind of reflective monoliths uh, using uh, solar ban. Um, uh, and now we have uh, sputter coating. I, I, I had the, the, the Philip Johnson Pittsburgh building, which is actually the headquarters of Pittsburgh plate, uh, uh, plate glass. Uh, which is the, the, the swan song of the solar ban technology. So that building gets built as uh, a sputter coat, coating, which is the, the technology that we can, that we use now, uh, uh, generally appears. Uh, and, and so uh, what sputter coat, coating uh, enables uh, us to do is to uh, deploy uh, mineral oxides of different kinds to change the, the the, the performance of the glass, for example, uh, producing glass that can be as filtering as solar ban, uh, but uh, much more transparent. And this uh, basically enables a number of uh, possibilities. You, you will see that after the 70s, solar ban is phased out. Now buildings are suddenly much more either transparent, uh, like, you know, the, this is the, the, the ultimate example of of, uh, of uh, the use of, of tempered glass, but, but also float glass, but, but uh, uh, also low e-coating uh, glass. Uh, but now uh, we see that transparency, the same material that uh, was aiming to uh, become uh, always transparent is used in, in many other, other uh, uh, ways. Uh, water tightness is, uh, is uh, another uh, performance. Uh, I'm not going to, to explain every one of them because uh, there is too much material. I want to basically give you some uh, insights in, in, in some of them and, and, and hopefully move uh, quickly to the, uh, to the assemblages. Water tightness obviously is uh, one of the first things that, that buildings uh, have to do. And the, the narrative uh, behind the, the, the watertight uh, chapter is that all the technologies that, uh, that uh, waterproofed envelopes used to be in, in traditional architecture concentrated in the roof, while facades were never so watertight. And in fact, they, they used to breathe much more. And all these technologies have been through the century falling down, coming down uh, and to, to wrap the envelope. So what, that's basically, uh, I give you a kind of idea of what uh, water tightness is about. Air tightness is, I think, a very interesting one that appears uh, also uh, at the end of the 19th century when uh, problems of uh, industrialization, uh, uh, growth of uh, the metropolis uh, create uh, uh, problems with the environment. Uh, this, the, the Spanish flu in, in, in 1918 
kills more people than so a, a new epidemics that are produced by uh, by uh, the accumulation of people in the in the big cities is another problem uh, and also obviously uh, chemical uh, warfare is something that happens at the beginning of the 20th century that makes people afraid of breathing and and that uh, is one of the, the, the threads that, uh, that you can read through the, uh, through the century and see how, uh, how it affects the, the way buildings uh, were designed. Obviously, at the same time, air conditioning happens, so you don't want to breathe the air out there, you want to condition the air. You want to treat the air, and in order to treat the air, you need to wrap yourself into a, into a bubble, into an airtight, Membrane. That is what characterizes the evolution of uh, 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 envelope technologies at the beginning of the of the century. Uh, the Larkin Building being a, 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 a very important uh, example, a building that suddenly cannot breathe at all because it has this kind of artificial ventilation system that makes it uh, breathe, and in fact is is uh, is uh, painted with. Uh, with a material that makes it entirely uh, uh, airtight, uh, and all the windows are, are locked. Uh, and, and so through the, the, the century, you see you know, the polio epi epidemics in, in 1952, the, the, the space uh, race suddenly making available to people a whole set of imag imagery that, uh, <clears throat> that uh, makes this life inside of a bubble uh, desirable uh, and, and drives very much uh, epidemics. The, 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 the bubble key, the very important character in the, in the 70s, uh, uh, and obviously the fumes that keep, uh, keep uh, re-emerging. And, uh, and so this uh, leads to uh, pro projects that, that try to implement that, that kind of uh, air tightness uh, at, at any uh, cost uh, through technologies like silicon, uh, which also has its own uh, history, or uh, home wraps, which is the, 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 the current solution to, uh, to the problem of, uh, of air tightness. Uh, uh, and, and then the buildings become so perfect at being airtight that in the, in the 70s, when the, the energy crisis hits, uh, what happens is that people turn down the air exchange and people start getting sick inside of the buildings because buildings were designed to have a certain air exchange. So it's, it's the famous sick building syndrome that, that in some ways is the collapse of the whole idea of the bubble as a, as a, as a building uh, technology. And then uh, it keeps going on through the, through the century. You know, the attacks, gas attacks that are no, no longer the the Germans, but, uh, but some kind of uh, weird sects, uh, epidemics, uh, and pollution. This is where we are uh, now, and, and, and this is uh, maybe producing some of the envelopes that, that, uh, that we are starting to uh, see, uh, and not, not only for these reasons, but I mean, the, the, probably the, the foremost example today is the, is the whole technology of the passive house, which basically uh, 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 seals the, the building and makes all the, the breathing uh, entirely uh, mechanized in order to save energy and, and add uh, um, uh, insulation. Uh, 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 but but it's a, a very uh, interesting example of what we can call the kind of airtight mentality that crosses uh, through the uh, through the century and, and going uh, uh, on, I mean, the other one is uh, uh, the, the other, um, uh, in some ways, um, uh, performance is also insulation. It has something to do, obviously, with the with the uh, question of the um, of the passive house uh, idea, uh, and uh, uh, the the chapter of of insulation is also, uh, I think, uh, interesting because buildings. Uh, in, at the end of the 19th century, there, there were very few buildings that were insulated. So the way of conditioning the, the environment was by, by uh, having a fire inside, uh, by, by having a heart. 
uh, uh, inside of the of the building, and it is only at the end of the 19th century that that uh, mineral wool uh, appears almost by uh, by chance, and people realize that there are certain materials that are durable and that can uh, that can contribute to the uh, flow of energy through the uh, through the walls through the uh, through the envelope, uh, and and so the the uh, the, in, the insulation business emerges and, and it uh, happens that it uh, becomes developed more or less at the time when the, the crisis of the 29 uh, happens and suddenly energy becomes very expensive and at that very moment is when, when the, the, the rock wool industry uh, explodes, explodes to the, to the point in which there are not sufficient uh, 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 supply. There is no, no, no su sufficient supply to, uh, to cover the, the demand for uh, insulating uh, buildings in the, in the 30s. And, and so this uh, goes on uh, 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 and, and produces uh, buildings or envelopes of, of buildings that are primarily driven by uh, insulation. So th this, is, uh, this is from um, uh, an architectural forum uh, from 1950, I think, where, which is dedicated to the curtain wall. And the curtain wall is basically a, a, a chunk of insulation and a corrugated uh, uh, steel plate. So buildings, uh, the, 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 the facade of the building, the main purpose of the facade of the building is precisely to insulate between the inside and the uh, outside and avoid the flow of energy uh, between do these two um, uh, milieus and, and obviously because of the demand uh, for increased uh, insulation, uh, uh, BASF in, invents uh, synthetic insulation which is no longer done by blowing through molten rocks which is basically how rock wool uh, was uh, produced but, but it becomes very cheap uh, to do and, and many of these uh, materials uh, I mean didn't, didn't exist. This, um, uh, this was invented in the 1950s, and now uh, it constitutes uh, probably a, a large amount of the, of the volume of matter that goes into the envelope of, uh, of, uh, of buildings. Asbestos is obviously a history uh, uh, on its own, uh, in which uh, you know, a material that at some point in the 50s is considered almost magic because it insulates, is, uh, is, um, is resilient, uh, it lasts, uh, it's fantastic, it's cheap, uh, uh, suddenly it, it, uh, it, it is found that it kills people. And so this is one case where you can see a, a species that becomes extinguished, it becomes extinguished because of the, the environment, which is that this material has to has to um, uh, share space with humans, and, and those two uh, things are not, are not uh, compatible, so it dies. Uh, um, uh, crisis of, uh, of 73, another push. So you, you can see how in the uh, crisis of the 29 and the oil crisis of the 73, there are moments in which those species that are using insulation suddenly uh, 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 become uh, almost uh, predatory and produce uh, something, a uh, uh, little story that is very interesting, which is the external insulation uh, finish, which is uh, this uh, foam uh, stabilized with a, with, a, with a special mortar that was invented in Germany uh, in the 50s, uh, but that is not, it doesn't become very successful uh, there. And then it is exported here, and drive it uh, makes a patent of it, and at some point it accounts for for I don't know 15 percent of all buildings in the, in in the commercial sector in the in the U.S. are made using this technology uh, of uh, uh, AFES, which which is also interesting because this can these are buildings made with AFES. You all. Uh, uh, know them. They are almost like made out of uh, cardboard, and they are good for making these buildings or, or for making this uh, in Las Vegas. It's, it's a material that you can sculpt, that you can easily. So it's a it's a kind of uh, very cheap and efficient solution 
that, that is transferred from Germany to the United States, is a species, and, and suddenly here it, it flourishes and it takes over the, <coughs> the, the market. This is a, one of the, the buildings that turn this, this kind of uh, uh, cheap commercial material into something that uh, belongs to, to a high profile uh, architecture. And, and actually, another, another one, one of the things that we've discovered through this, uh, uh, through this research is a number of characters like Pietro Berluschi, uh, who is this guy, uh, who uh, is, is a very important guy. I mean, I, I, I think that some of these guys that I call them, uh, so we, we discover a whole new set of villains and heroes of architecture. Uh, that I, I sustain that are more important than Miss van der Rohe and Le Corbusier, but nobody knows in the, in the field. And I'm being polemic again, but here is Pietro Beluski, who was a native from Portland, uh, uh, berat berating uh, uh, Michael Graves, who made the, the, this building with uh, apes. Obviously, Beluski was, uh, was, uh, was the guy who synthesized the first curtain wall. We'll see it. Uh, uh, later on. But anyway, IFS is, is very interesting because it, it produces this type of, of buildings that at some point become uh, <clears throat> uh, very prominent in the, in the, in the history of, of design. And, and, and yes, maybe there were certain things that postmodern architects were doing that uh, had to do with uh, rewriting history or making comments to the history of architecture, but they were also uh, able to do these buildings because there was this material that was insulating them uh, with a very cheap price. Uh, it was a material that failed. I mean, this is a famous uh, uh, failure case. Peter Eisenman also covered with apes in Cincinnati. Nothing, no, nothing to blame Peter for. Uh, it, was a, it was a general uh, problem that Eves had because it, it started building condensation inside. So the, the, the fact that the insulation was put outside build the condensation inside of the building and rot the, the, the eaves from inside. And there were massive lawsuits uh, uh, for buildings with eaves, and, and many of them had to be rebuilt. And uh, again, you know, uh, 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 the question of insulation, retrofitting, something that is suddenly now very present to all of us. And, and I think maybe not present enough. And when I when I uh, talk about looking at these uh, uh, problems as, as, uh, as possible uh, origins of, uh, of new styles, I, I, I am totally convinced that the, the way of, uh, for example, these are, these are this is a collection of elements that we see now conventionally applied in, in buildings. Massive sections of insulation, massive uh, uh, plastic, uh, corrugations uh, of uh, mullions and windows, uh, and, and uh, one th this kind of fatness that buildings have now, because the, there are certain constraints that have to do with performance, with insulation, are obviously a, a field where we should we should be working on as as architects. We are not necessarily, I, I don't believe that architects are people who are simply looking at the history of architecture and doing now postmodern and then uh, the construction and, and so on and so forth. We should be looking at, uh, at why do we think that thin building elements in facades are beautiful? Because we've been, we've been taught by people educated in the 50s in a moment of uh, plenty of energy and lack of concern for the, for the environment, while, while we know now that the, this is impossible to, to, uh, to sustain. So maybe a, a kind of revision of, uh, of fatness is, is uh, the rigueur. Uh, now, uh, new ways of, uh, of uh, looking at, at buildings. Uh, fifth uh, uh, category of, uh, of performance, I'm not going to talk about this economy the depth, the weight of buildings, the, the logistic problems of assembling a, a, a facade um, are a part of this section. And I'm going to quickly move on to the next uh, section. I don't know, you tell me when, you, when, when it's too, uh, too much, uh, we, we stop. But this is an interesting case, which is the, the Malians. The, the, 
the, the malleons are an element that, uh, that uh, we intuitively uh, understand now, but, uh, uh, but, but uh, it could have become anything else. And, and so one of the chapters is dedicated to this kind of history of the evolution of the malleon as a component, very much like, like Cuvier would look at the feet of the, of the bird and see how it evolves uh, 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 through, the, through the species. So the, uh, and this is part of the, of the research, and, and uh, you know, we, we drew, uh, we collected these malleons, we tried to, uh, to code them and to understand where the different uh, gaskets uh, and how the, the gaskets operate and where they are pressure equalized or where they are not and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and for example, what is the, the, the position of the malleon in respect to the line of the glass? So you, you see uh, how the malleons are sometimes sticking out, like in, in, the, in the Miss van der Rohe buildings, and now hardly any malleon sticks out. Why is that? So it doesn't happen because architects suddenly uh, think that malleons are ugly it relates to a whole set of environmental conditions that have to do with concern with, uh, with energy and also the, the phasing out of certain ideas of, of uh, uh, producing buildings. But so the malleons are, are a, a type of technology that is very much anti-tectonic. Uh, uh, so if the architecture with a capital A, as, as, as we uh, we have uh, studied it, it's about piling things. Uh, malleons are much more part of a paradigm in which the wall is almost like a, like a textile, like a, like a series of small elements that, that have some elements that, that offer uh, strength and, and some uh, other uh, infill systems that, uh, that form the wall. So malleons have to do with this type of traditional uh, architectures, the Fachwerk uh, or the balloon, uh, the balloon frames are uh, an entirely uh, different family of, uh, of, uh, of buildings. And, and so malleons uh, start by building this type of buildings, building, uh, making buildings that were almost for the leisure cl classes in, in Northern uh, Europe wanting to, uh, uh, to cultivate uh, uh, species that, that were not viable in, in their uh, climate and, and, and form these walls of glass and, and profiles, uh, iron uh, profiles, extruded iron profiles that, that uh, start uh, adopting forms uh, that basically produce gaskets, uh, pressure caps, and, and elements that, uh, that uh, create the, the inertia in the section that makes them uh, withstand the, the or, or uh, um, hold the, the, the world uh, to, together. Uh, so uh, th there is a number of other uh, functions that emerge at this time, like markets, stations, uh, factories that require abundant uh, space and light that develops these, these technologies. Uh, uh, I mean, Paxton, uh, who designed the Crystal Palace, which is almost the, the epitome of, uh, of these technologies, was a gardener. So the, the, these technologies emerge out of, uh, of a set of technologies that, that come from, from gardening and, and then, uh, that then evolve with patent glazing and uh, cover, covering the, the, the profiles with lead so that they adjust to the movement of the, of the, of the glass. Uh, uh, they uh, are, they, they ha they, there is a, a, a very important input there, for example, when uh, shops appear in metropolitan centers because the, the, the rough uh, extrusions that are used to uh, make these buildings uh, are not so sufficiently sophisticated for, uh, for people to, <clears throat> to use. So more sophisticated uh, uh, profiles of the malleons uh, start to, to appear, and then the architects uh, uh, try to theorize it. So uh, Gropius and, and Gideon uh, come together and sell to everybody that they've invented, uh, invented it, invented the curtain wall, invented the, the, the buildings made with uh, glass uh, and, uh, and steel, and, and that is the moment in which people, 
architects become aware that, that, uh, that this is a whole new technology, and then there is Bauhaus uh, uh, exploiting the, the, the kind of industrial production of, uh, uh, of, uh, of Malians in a, in a relatively crude uh, manner uh, still. Um, and then uh, another thing happens, uh, and, and the next evolution, in a way, happens here in the, in the States at the end of the Second World War, when, when the whole military industry that uh, used to produce uh, uh, um, the cockpits of, uh, of uh, planes in aluminum, which was an expensive uh, metal at, at the time, become suddenly the commission. Massive uh, production capacity that, that needs to find an alternative uh, uh, field of, of being deployed, and so at that, that point, you know, Kaiser Aluminum and, and many other uh, um, companies that were created in order to, to support the, the war machine uh, uh, move from making weapons to making buildings. And in that change, the tolerances of buildings are reduced by, by 10 times. So the, the, the type of tolerances that, that architects used to work with uh, in, in, in the Gropius buildings are much bigger than the, the tolerances that appear when, when uh, Kaiser Aluminum and, and Robertson and many other companies in the Rust Belt convert from the war machine to the, to the civil uh, uh, uses. And, and this is, this is the, the building that I was uh, telling you is the first building that has a curtain wall uh, made with aluminum and glass, and is designed by Pietro Berluschi, uh, built in Portland, is that building, it's, it's an incredible building, it has double glazing, uh, uh, ground source heating, heat pumps, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a kind of technical wonder, and probably the first example, the first mature example of a, a, a curtain wall as we, as we know it, Today, but look at the, the crudeness of the. So, the, uh, Beluski, and, and this is why I'm saying maybe Beluski was more important than, than Ms. Van, Ms. van der Rohe, uh, even if maybe we like um, better Ms. van der Rohe, uh, thought that he could use aluminum because all the aluminum industry in the Rust Belt was dying, was basically dying to sell this, this material to someone. So he said, well, aluminum used to be expensive and, and made for planes, and you can get incredible tolerances. I'm going to use it for a curtain wall, or for, I don't know how he called it. But so Beluski make, makes this, and, and, and funnily enough, Beluski uh, sells his company to become the dean at MIT, and, uh, and sells it to SOM. And so SOM is the, the, takes over uh, uh, the, the, uh, I, the, the work that Beluski had been uh, doing and makes Leverhouse. But Leverhouse is, 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 a, is going back because Leverhouse is single glazed and is made with steel uh, instead of with uh, aluminum. So the, the, these are, uh, the, this is the, in a way the next, uh, and, and maybe Leverhouse and, and uh, the, the UN building and the equitable are the moment in which uh, the, curt the, the paradigmatic curtain wall uh, appears uh, as, a, as, a, as an architectural element. Uh, and th there are different problems, and we are not going to. Uh, and then the, the next, the next uh, uh, problem appears, which is that these buildings are basically holding the glass with putty, and putty cracks and has to be replaced. And, and leaks. I mean, the, actually, the UN building and, and the lever house had to be entirely redone uh, shortly after being, being built because they were leaking everywhere. Because these tall buildings could not withstand the, 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 the pressure of the air when, when you make a, a building tall instead of a, of a greenhouse. So, as you can see, I mean, the UN building was a massive experiment. The lever house was a massive experiment. These, these uh, people didn't really know how these things were going to, uh, uh, to, to, to come out. So there, there is a number of, uh, of technologies that were being developed in other industries, like railroad, uh, in railway industries, uh, or, or fridges, uh, gaskets, using rubber, that, uh, that people started to think that they could reuse them in, in, 
in buildings, in, in curtain walls. And that's when the gaskets appear and when Sarinen uh, builds, uh, uh, suddenly takes these curtain walls that had been created in, in Park Avenue <coughs> and moves them to, to the suburbs and uses the technologies that he sees in, in, uh, in uh, General Motors in order to, to make, uh, to make the, and Ford, in order to make the, the gaskets of, the, of uh, those, uh, those buildings. And then the, ne the, next, the next problem appears, which is uh, uh, aluminum is one of the most, the most uh, um, uh, conductive materials. So, so, for example, if you look at, at the detail of the equitable building, which you see here, you see the, the aluminum going right through the, 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 the glass envelope. So even if he had double glazing, because he thought the, the double glazing would, would act as, uh, as, um, um, uh, as insulator, uh, then he, he makes a huge cold bridge with the aluminum, which is the most, uh, the most conductive uh, element you can use, much more conductive than, than, than steel. So the problem of debridging or, or cutting the, the, the cold bridges in the mallions becomes the next uh, the next iteration of the of the problem and, and uh, when you look at, at mallions like the ones we, we we see now you see all these elements that are gaskets that that serve in order to prevent uh, air and water leakage and there are uh, debridging elements which are these elements that are not made with metal that basically cut the 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 coal bridges through the uh, through the wall that's that's basically what keeps adding complexity to these elements. Uh, the last uh, stage of complexity probably is what is called the, the pressure equalization of the, of the, of the mallion, in which the mallions start uh, being mm, designed with these internal uh, cavities that, that uh, uh, equalize the pressure of the air right where the water may leak inside of the, uh, of the building. So that's why Contemporary mallions are so uh, contorted and so uh, complex because they are full of chambers that in some ways allow the air in inside of the mallion in order to pressure equalize so that the, the points where, where the air and the water want to get into the building, by, by then the, 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 the pressure of the inside and the outside of the, of the envelope uh, are, are more or less the same and therefore there is not such a strong uh, uh, possibility that that it will it will go through, um, and then there are joints, uh, which basically are uh, elements that are designed in order to allow the building to move, and there are membranes, which uh, which is uh, Tyvek, for example, which is another element that didn't exist before the 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 seventies, and now every <coughs> every residential building. Uh, everywhere is using these kind of uh, breathable uh, home wraps. I mean, there, there is the whole, the, 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 the history is also inside these elements. I'm not going to uh, uh, go through this uh, uh, because we are maybe running out of time. I, I should try to uh, tell you a little bit more about the, the, a little bit about the assemblages and, and, and stop. Uh, the, two, uh, um, the two other um, ways in which we, we look at, at envelopes where the modes of assemblage of, of uh, contemporary envelopes. One is the tendency to panelization, to prefabrication, and how it comes uh, into uh, being. Sarinen, one of the thinnest or the thinnest curtain wall uh, at the time, the IBM um, uh, <coughs> complex. Uh, or uh, this, which is, a, is an interesting uh, chapter also uh, is the, uh, about the the walls, the contemporary walls being increasingly layered. So you get layers for insulation, you get layers for waterproofing, you get vapor layers uh, in order to avoid uh, internal uh, rotting of the profile. You get a rain screen that pressure equalizes the 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 envelopes. Uh, so in some ways, what, what used to be an element that was made by piling elements is now uh, become a, a kind of hidden geology of, uh, uh, of uh, layers uh, that are, have different performances and, and uh, cons construct the envelope. And th this is actually a, a, a building from Morphosis, uh, 
uh, uh, one of the things that that uh, that you see in some of the of the recent uh, uh, examples of rain screens is that the idea that the rain screen, like for example, if you look at the rain screen in the Guggenheim in Bilbao from Frank Gehry, is a rain screen that still pretends to be uh, a hole. But what you see in some of the co contemporary rain screens is that people are uh, ashamed about showing that, or in, in fact, that becomes uh, a, a, a trait that can be architecturally exploited to show that the, the wall is constructed through layers and turn that into some uh, form of, of visual uh, uh, or, or um, uh, aesthetic uh, potential like in this, in this uh, building. So uh, I'm, I'm, I think I'm, I'm not going to go, uh, as I thought, through the uh, through the assemblages, but uh, I just wanted to uh, uh, recap on the, the idea uh, of these nine assemblages that we have identified, the, the first of them being the, the, the curtain wall, which is not really about transparency. The curtain wall is, is about being able to, to produce uh, this whole uh, city made out of uh, transparent elements full of glass and, and bearing uh, con uh, 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 um, connotations that have to do with democracy, with uh, indus indus industrialization, uh, and with uh, uh, so in a way the curtain wall becomes the the uh, element that represents the modern democracy, modern industry, uh, uh, transparency in politics. Uh, so it's, it's a it's a it's a it's an assemblage that is performing in, in certain ways, but is also um, uh, attaching uh, or, or incorporating uh, certain meanings that are uh, important to the, uh, uh, to, the, to the buildings that, uh, that are, are, were designed like, uh, like that. So curtain walls are obviously uh, relate, as we, we have said, to uh, garden uh, buildings, uh, but also to the reconstruction of the of the uh, war machine. Uh, we've seen this one. Th this is an interesting uh, case. Is Charles Lukman is is one hero villain that that uh, that uh, we have found. This is the the CEO of uh, Lever Brothers who commissioned the Lever House, and he was an architect himself. And he basically after decades of crisis in the, since the 29 when nothing was being built in Manhattan decides as he becomes the CEO of, of, uh, of Lever Brothers that he's going to build the headquarters in Park Avenue in Manhattan, thinking that the, the stock market is going to come back. So in a way, he, he's a visionary uh, of, uh, of the, the, the return of the, of the stock market, the return of wealth uh, uh, after the the crisis and the whole recovery of the of the uh, of the economy after the, the the war, and and so after Lever House in, in Park Avenue, a number of other prototypes that you you see, I mean uh, Pepsi Cola building, uh, Seagram. Look look at the look at the flimsiness of insulation, for example. I mean, this is a, this is a coal bridge. Uh, without any uh, uh, without any any shame, because obviously they couldn't be ashamed because they, they didn't have that problem. Like like Charles Luckman had convinced everybody that you know energy is going to be nearly free once nuclear energy happens. There is no no limit to energy. We can consume as much energy we, we need. Therefore, we do other things with our with our mallions. Our, our, our mallions are sticking out of the of the building. We've seen this. Then the the, the crisis comes. Then these type of uh, buildings appear, and the mallions, from being uh, outside of the of the of the facade, as as a sign of industrial production, precision, repetition. Uh, transparency are suddenly subsumed in this kind of corporate behemoths that that uh, uh, grow everywhere in the in the U.S., particularly in the in the 70s, that are also trying to uh, insulate the uh, 
the, the buildings uh, better. And th this is uh, an example of, uh, of this building. You, you all know the NS NSA, so the, the kind of opaqueness. Uh, uh, and this is a, this is a, a, a very important moment uh, in the evolution of, of curtain walls. Uh, the, the Hancock uh, Tower in Boston, designed by <coughs> by uh, Paykop Fried, which is con conscious about this need to uh, to save energy. And, and at the same time uh, uh, introduces double glazing and introduces double glazing, but the double glazing fails. And it cracks and it needs to be entirely reclad. It used to be called the Plywood Palace, the building, for a while. And so that sets back the incorporation of double glazing technologies for a decade. So after this happens, nobody wants to touch double glazing for, for 10, 15 years. All buildings go back to, uh, uh, to single glazing. And you know, now, I mean, we're not going to, to but now obviously we can, we can this is the, the, the mother of all uh, curtain walls, the Elbe Philharmonie that does everything, forms the glass, has uh, uh, fritting, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to, to uh, explain this. I'm just going to, uh, to run through. Uh, Precast concrete is another one. Uh, if there is something that is... Uh, uh, Precast concrete, uh, the, the title is uh, Sin and Redemption because the, the theory is that Precast concrete constantly oscillates between, uh, between artistic performance, like this one, uh, Eleanor Code, who is basically the first person who fabricates precast uh, concrete for the purpose of doing... Uh, for example, the, the, the Waddington uh, Lion in Westminster Bridge is, is designed with, with something that, that is the beginning of, of precast uh, concrete. And so precast concrete uh, oscillates between this kind of playful uh, use and, and, and uh, the, the prefabrication programs. Uh, this, is, this is part of the RT side, and this is part of the, the, the kind of programs with, with kind of um, uh, social uh, and political consciousness, uh, Khrushchev in Moscow, uh, uh, the equivalent here, actually the father of Mitt Romney, who... who uh, anyway, I mean, uh, we are not going to uh, uh, explain this. The, the, the another um, uh, thread uh, or lineage is the, the screens, the, the masks, the the, the, the pressure, the, the whole problem of pressure equalizing buildings that comes from Norwegian farms and, and then evolves into, into uh, malleons and, and uh, facade technologies <coughs> uh, and, and this idea of, uh, of the different layers that, that now uh, a, a, a contemporary uh, wall uh, has as opposed to, to a kind of piling of elements is, is uh, vertical layers that sometimes are not seen and sometimes are, uh, well, the, this is in, in the process, but sometimes are uh, deliberately made explicit uh, uh, and sometimes even more than made explicit out of, a, out of a rain screen. Suddenly the rain screen goes crazy and starts doing all kinds of, of things. The all glass envelope, the, the search for, for having no, uh, even not even mullions coming out of uh, maybe some uh, commercial, uh, driven by some commercial interest, but then becoming, <coughs> becoming something more uh, being enhanced by by float glass uh, and and silicon uh, technologies. Uh, uh, double glazing. This is maybe an interesting one because it, it incorporates uh, climate, and and so double glazing belongs to the to the lineages of. The Kastenfenster and, and uh, more uh, traditional uh, building uh, typologies that, that uh, for example, were used in the north of Spain to heat naturally uh, uh, buildings by collecting uh, heat from, uh, from the sun through cladding them entirely. This is in the 17th century. So this is not, uh, not yesterday. These are, these are things that people realized that there were greenhouse effects and, and they could use them to climatize. Uh, Albert Crosby, for example, talks about, about the whole <clears throat> development of, of greenhouses as some sort of case 
of uh, uh, biological colonization of the wealthy nations in Northern Europe that were suddenly able to import and grow species that could not grow there uh, uh, before. Uh, the invention of the, the trombe wall by uh, uh, Edward Morse, an American zoologist who actually patented something very similar to the trombe wall in 1881. Uh, um, Russia is an interesting case because obviously uh, glass is aesthetically interesting to the, revolu the revolutionaries, but it's bloody cold there. So they all systematically use uh, double uh, glazing in, in, uh, in all kinds of, of places. This, uh, this is also an interesting case. Le Corbusier in the village, Bob, uh, has this massive window and realizes that the, the, the window is doing something. So he builds this in... in I don't know, 1914, I think, or, or, or something like that. And then it comes up with the concept of the double wall, which is the, the sorry, the, the, uh, the oh God, how do, 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 does he call it? The um, mur neutralisant, uh, the, the, the neutralizing wall, which, which, uh, which uh, produces this, this kind of, uh, le double layer around the building that is supposed to be uh, uh, pumped with hot air and, and then no other heating is, is needed. It fails uh, miserably, uh, tries to apply it uh, in Moscow where, where they are more or less, um, more or less uh, sympathetic to, uh, to his ideas, uh, but... Uh, but uh, doesn't work either. It applies, it uh, tries to apply it in the Armée du Salut, uh, but uh, he gets a uh, uh, down spec and he loses one layer and then the, the building becomes an oven and, and then the, fortunately for, for Le Corbusier, the building is bombed the, the, the following year uh, in the war and he gets the, the, the commission to reconstruct it after the war and, and by then he forgets about the Mur Neutralisant and, and builds uh, Brissol Ales. Uh, the whole uh, 60s hippie uh, collection of uh, the Sun, Lee Porter, but I mean, uh, we are not going to... Uh, uh, the, another interesting example of the curtain walls, the, the, the whole uh, uh, proliferation of this type of technology in Europe uh, uh, in, the, in the 80s and the 90s uh, by the kind of uh, progressive governments that are concerned with the environment but are also trying to provide people with the opportunity to open uh, the window. But obviously nobody wants to open the window because it's, it's screw up, screws up the, the whole air conditioning system. So they, they, there is a, an episode where in Germany, uh, because of this law of co-determination in which the workers in the companies can decide about the buildings, suddenly uh, all companies are building these incredibly expensive uh, double walls with, uh, with uh, louvers. Uh, anyway, tensile, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to uh, conclude. Uh, uh, I, I'll show simply the slides. Media is another one of the uh, of the uh, assemblages that uh, that we have in the in the book and how media is incorporated and the, the narrative is that it goes from uh, uh, media being incorporated in order in order to signify to give a message to media uh, later on becoming much more of of a creation of uh, of uh, of an atmosphere. Um, in, in, uh, with the, the you know, LED technologies, it's kind of visionary. It's very interesting. Blade Runner uh, uh, is made at the same, the same year that LED appears in the, in the market. And, and you know, if you look at, uh, at the image in Blade Runner, you see that the, the, the facade is still made with TVs next to each other, not with LEDs. Uh, uh, so uh, th there are all these kinds of, uh, of interesting examples. Uh, Lehman Brothers becoming Barclays uh, overnight uh, through these technologies, short selling. Vegetated facades is another uh, assemblage. And uh, the final one is uh, uh, kinetic facades uh, or the possibility that 
that the envelope uh, uh, can uh, react to uh, uh, two conditions, uh, and it, it reacts in, in multiple uh, ways. There are, there are a number of examples. This one is, is, is very interesting. Uh, IIT Hall mis made this glass building and puts these louvers that uh, apparently nobody, nobody uh, touched them except Hilversheimer, who was going every morning and controlling the louvers in the building. And, and therefore, the building was working. When Hilbert Salmer uh, died or retired, and, and the louvers, the, they threw away the louvers, and then the building became an oven. Um, <clears throat> uh, anyway, uh, so the, this, is the, this, is the, this is the only image that I, I brought of my work <laughs> at the end of the, of the kin. I know that I brought this one also, which is one that we, we did recently. Uh, I don't know whether it's going to work. It's a, it's, a, it's a kinetic facade that moves with the wind in a, in a building in, in, uh, in Locarno, for the Locarno Film uh, Festival. Uh, but anyway, just kind of to conclude, uh, what, what do I think this whole proposal uh, does? Is, um, is, 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 is I, I think it tries to overcome the two, the two ways of reading architecture uh, for those people who have tried to theorize the, the building facts. Uh, and, and those people who have tried to, to, to theorize buildings as, as material uh, assemblages have, uh, have been, in a way, reliant on, on two uh, ideas. One is tectonics. And, and you know, I, I, I really like uh, uh, the book uh, from Frampton, and, and he, in fact, I asked him to uh, write the, the write the the the, the prologue of, uh, to the to the book, telling him that that this book was made to kill tectonics, <laughs> and he did, he didn't he didn't want to do it. <laughs> uh, <coughs> but anyway. Uh, Ken, Ken was incredibly uh, influential in, 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 in on my generation, and, and, uh, and obviously what he did was uh, was fantastic. But I, I think that uh, to think that the that uh, the, the the fact of building is still driven by tectonics is something that is going to fa face out in the face of uh, all the problems with pollution, energy and so on and so forth that, that we are living today, which do not have yet a tectonic, uh, or are basically not tectonic problems. Uh, that doesn't mean that, that they cannot become tectonic. I, I gave the, the example of the, uh, for example, of the fattening of the, of the walls by effect of uh, increasing uh, insulation. Uh, uh, because I, I wanted, in a way, those are the moments that, that for me are more interesting in the book, is to, to read the book and to see in how in these ecologies, in this kind of delicate balance that, that form every one of the, of the species, ev there are vectors of evolution in every one of the, these uh, cases, and those are the vectors that we can, we can exploit as... Uh, as uh, as architects, and I don't think that those vectors are pointing in the in the direction of tectonics, despite the fact that tectonics is the dominant discourse of the the build. Uh, uh, well, I mean tectonics and uh, phenomenology. Now, the, the other the other thing that that I try to polemicize again against is the idea uh, is the the other side of the of the coin, which is. Uh, that architects who are interested in, in, in the fact of, of building end up discussing buildings in these two terms. Uh, so uh, it's either tectonics or is how the light comes and creates, casts the shadows in whatever and how. Uh, and, and in some ways, this uh, idea uh, of the performances, these five performances, are exactly about the, op the opposite. To, to, because energy and heat and light and air are 
are a measurable part of phenomenology. There is no mystery to them. You can calculate the U value. You can calculate the air leakage. You can calculate the, so it, it, it is about revising all these categories that architects interested in this kind of stuff have been uh, using until now in a kind of mysterious manner because I, I, I actually don't understand. I, I understand, I get what they are uh, interested in, but, but I don't understand anything about what they say. While I understand your value, I understand the air leakage, I, I, I can quantify it. And in that way, this proposal of uh, refocusing in the, in, the, in the technology in a very hard uh, manner and, and refocusing on those elements that are now loaded with, uh, with uh, political uh, content, the, the, the elements, uh, uh, are, are, I think, uh, uh, defying these two poles in which uh, building facts have been theorized in the past. And, and this is basically what this tries to overcome. So thank you very much for your attention and sorry for the... <laughs> Do I stay here for the Q&A? Or we don't have Q&A because it's too long. OK. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I can. I don't know the day. Fascinating lecture. I mean, really brilliant uh, set of correlations uh, as a way of reading Thank you. Um, an alternative history. I guess my question is, where's, I, I, I had the sense that somehow it was bad news for architects, meaning that, uh, you know, that, that somehow architecture followed industry and it followed all these other things. So. When you talk about fatness, or you made the diagram of the mullion being internalized as a kind of result of other factors, where does innovation lie relative to our own discipline? That, that is, I mean, uh, that's, I am basically trying to attack the discipline as it is formed. So I am not interested in preserving the discipline. In fact, I'm, I'm interested in demolishing it, because I think it's pointless. I mean, seriously, I, I, I think that if architects, if architects keep uh, working uh, as we have been working, uh, we are going to uh, phase ourselves out of the contemporary world. Uh, and, and I think that, I, I, I believe that architects can still do things. I believe that the, the discipline can be uh, refunded in, in, in different uh, on different grounds that are not the discipline as we know it. I, I, I really uh, uh, dislike this, uh, all these architects talking about the importance of the, of the discipline because I think that it's, it's a kind of suicidal um, uh, drive. I, I think that unless we are able to redeploy our, our capacities and our talents uh, in order to address questions that are pressing for everybody, and they, this is why uh, uh, the, the, the book is, is organized, uh, trying to analyze every one of these uh, entities in an ecology, in an ecology that has to do with energy, that has to do with politics, that has to do, you know, politics, the, the German case of the, the law of co-determination. Co uh, I mean, this is an environment. The legal environment is an environment, the same way that the, 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 the kind of uh, climatic change is an environment and the carbon emissions are an environment. And unless we are able to locate our practice in, in this kind of wider ecology, we are going to disappear as a practice. I mean, I'm, I'm being kind of uh, maybe pessimistic and negative, but I'm not, I'm not pessimistic. I'm actually optimistic. I believe that it can be done. I believe that if we look at the right uh, concerns and, and we learn to, to look at the history of, of architecture in a different way that not always goes back to tectonics or the discipline or the orders or 
So, so but it looks at, at the, 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 the practice. I, I, I much rather prefer to be a practitioner than a kind of disciplinarian. Any, any other questions out there? <laughs> a little bit of polemic. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, clearly some, it's a fascinating history of material culture, right? But yet you claim two things which are, uh, were left a bit unexplored. One is the political dimension. Who controls the production? Who sets the paradigms? Who's been controlled by those paradigms? And what power do, do certain groups have of resisting them or creating an alternative model? So this kind of natural environment sets up a very self-referential history that is sort of almost automatic. Right? So the emergence of the energy crisis, uh, the, the bank crisis, all these events are left as some kind of natural phenomena, some kind of a storm that came by, transformed things, and then suddenly you know, the profile went in or went out without really questioning who's producing the, the aluminum what is the capital that has been moved? What's the labor that has been implied? It really, so for me, there's, there's a question there, and there's the other question, is whether, uh, what, are the, what is at stake? What are the problems? You, you talk about water, energy, and air as the three things. But you mentioned the politics of, who can, again, who has access to them? What are the resources that have been used? Mm. What are the social movements? What are the, the social structures that lay behind the production and access of these of these elements, because most of the elements that we're looking at are controlled by very central powers, right? Mm. Through capital, through banking loans, through all kind of systems. So it's a question, if you want to polemic, I wanted to. Yeah, but I mean, this is, this is also something that, that is, uh, is, a, is very important for, for me, uh, which is that I, uh, or let's say an another uh, target, <laughs> Uh, of uh, of these uh, of these proposals or this reading of uh, of uh, of the practice is uh, you know I, I don't think that uh, as an architect I can manipulate uh, or I can decide what the banks are going to do or who is going to control the production uh, that I do as a, as a as a citizen I'm concerned with it and so on and so forth but it's pointless for me uh, to, to try from the position of the architect to, uh, you know, I mean, the, the, the whole idea of the, of the um, activist architecture, which, which I think is, is very fine, very respectable, uh, um, sometimes, sometimes interesting, uh, sometimes very interesting, actually. Uh, I mean, I think people like uh, Assemble are genuinely creating new structures of, uh, of uh, clientele uh, for, for architects, are, are changing the ways in which architecture is produced. But it's because they are operating within those, those, uh, uh, the, within those practices. They, they, regardless of what is your, your, your ideology, your practice as, a, as an architect is, uh, is bound to the manipulation of, of certain things. Or, or, or let's say, for me, the, the, the practice is still very much about shaping spaces and matter. And, uh, uh, you know, I can fill my cities with public spaces, which is a kind of cliche. I mean, the, the more public space you put in a master plan, the better the city is. No, wrong. There are, there are well studied uh, examples. Like Melun Sanart, uh, no, not Melun Sanart, uh, Mar Marne La Vallée, uh, where you know this idea of uh, of uh, high rises or towers inside public space doesn't work because nobody can afford to maintain this amount of public space. For example, so there there are certain uh, cliches that are almost naive when you when you hear architects uh, talking talking about them, and I, I I think that by looking at at air water energy, we are back into, uh, into our domain. So the politicians can, can uh, the good politicians and the bad politicians can do whatever they want on their, on their sphere, 
but finally they have to come back to us to shape the space and to, to, to define how flows of energy, air, water occur in the space that we live. And that's where the, uh, the power of architecture is. And, and water, air, and energy are about the most politically loaded things that we can, we can tamper with today. So uh, to, to design cities that uh, have lots of public space or buildings that have uh, a lot of uh, open spaces for people to meet, uh, which is another kind of cliche, um, is fine, but, but is not, uh, we are not going to, to, to change uh, the world as much as we can if we focus on the elements. So, is this working? Yes. So, uh, you mentioned that when we go back to energy, water, and air, we go back to our domain, a space that is controlled, but we have more control. But you also show at the beginning of the lecture uh, Permas de Lisa, which um, it became, it's become the sort of um, entity that uh, deals with architects and communicates with architects, but really does the majority of the innovation, the majority of the design, very well detached from the figure of the architect. Um, and it feels very much like this domain that you claim as ours is really more one of communication rather than one of, of design. I, I, I think we just have vacated that domain. When we uh, sit down and design a facade by putting lines like that, but we don't understand what that line is, is when we, when we are vacating something that, that we should be in control of. And, and so other people, project managers, uh, uh, manufacturers, companies like Permastilisa, are basically occupying the space that, that we had control over and we no longer control. And so unless we create the knowledge and we, we and the, this, this is about uh, starting to think about that knowledge. I mean, the field is immense, it's enormous. But unless we are able to have a minimum uh, uh, understanding so that when, when you go to a meeting with Permastilisa and you look at the profile, you see basically what is going on, you are nothing. You keep, you keep drawing parallel lines. But we are not, you, you're not grasping the, the, the really interesting problem that, that, uh, that lies. And, and I think that, uh, that the, the other, the other uh, result of that is that in order to show that we are doing architecture, we have to do all kinds of gestures. We have to, you know, do cantilevers here and uh, something that is, uh, so that to do architecture is to do things that are very extravagant. I, I am now increasingly interested in, in a form of architecture that is almost like under the radar, that is, uh, that is uh, much more subdued, much more about close attention than about gestures uh, that can, can be seen. Uh, and it is a problem of communication, because what happens is that the, the public out there are used to Frank Gehry and Zaha Hadid. And they, they don't understand that in thinking uh, how to structure a malleon, there is any, any architecture. While, in fact, you know, you can gesticulate as much as you want with your building that you are never going to actually act politically in any significant way unless you get into the problem of the energy, of, of the flow of energy through a building. Call to arms of the profession, the, uh, the sort of change the profession in a way essentially Let's get back into the details. Let's draw. Let's not spec it and wait for like Mark Simmons at front to go to figure out and get get it costed, right? Then doesn't the education in a way have to address this itself? I mean, I mean certainly. So I'm, because I'm, in a way, it's uh, this is the fun. I mean, I've taught at TU Delft for six years, right? And now I'm here, and this is my biggest sort of I think dialogue now. It's like how do you, as an academic and a practitioner and a theorist, address this within the, the current American architectural education system? How can we, how, 
what do you think we should do differently as, as educators in this country specifically to address well, to, this issue? To, to start with, I think there is a this kind of sea change, which is to forget about architecture as art history. I, I, I think that you know architecture is now uh, taken over by by people pretending that they are relating to some sort of history uh, history of uh, of the discipline. Uh, uh, which is very much shaped on on art history, or, or, so the, the study of art. I, I think that uh, that the way in which uh, um, schools are teaching, particularly in the U.S., is shaped by a, by a paradigm of uh, of the history of art, and uh, I, I think that 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 is uh, that is a disaster. I, I think that we need to change to a, to a, a to a way of teaching uh, architecture uh, as a different type of practice that is not necessarily artistic in the sense that you know it looks good it uh, kind of does uh, but that goes back to to some very fundamental things that actually artists are very, are very interested in these things people like like saraceno or or people like uh, what's the other guy uh, anyway, I am very bad with artists. <laughs> Alejandro, thank you very much for you've given us a lot to think about. Pleasure. Yeah.